In today's video, we're going to go over some questions that you've had either on our Facebook channel, our YouTube channel, um, or just various questions that we've gotten here in the Garden Center. Hi, I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings. And first off, though, I want to thank you for the excellent season that all of you, our faithful followers and or gardeners who have ordered um, from GardenCrossings.com and who have come into our retail garden center here in Zeeland, Michigan. Um, we really appreciate your business and without you, this would just be a shell. But because of you, we're able to fill it with the beautiful flowers and beautiful plants that we can deliver here locally and also across the United States. So sincerely, we thank you. So today I'm gonna go through a bunch of questions that you've had, and we're gonna actually just start off with one of the videos we recently did on YouTube was showing you the gardeners removing all of the annuals uh, from some of our garden beds out here in the Proven Winter Signature Garden here at Garden Crossings. So let's see here. To start off with, um, we'll pop the name up on the screen because some of these are just really not even names, they're just handles. Uh, but her question is, hi Heidi, when do you cut back your butterfly bushes? I have two in large pots and would like to cut them back so they won't be damaged by snow and wind this winter. Your videos are so informational and I love that you share the details of lesser known varieties to add to your gardens. That's true. I don't want to tell you about everything you know about. You want to hear about new things. So that is one of my goals is to share with you new plant varieties that you maybe have never heard of before. You make great recommendations in your videos, sharing the good and the failures along the way. Love from New Jersey. So that is true because I don't want you to think that everything is rosy with gardening. We too have our successes, which that's what the goal is. We all wanna have garden successes, but we also have failures. And I think if I don't share with you my garden failures, you'll just feel maybe like if you have something that doesn't work out that you're doing something wrong. Just because you have a garden failure, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. Some things just plain and simple don't work and they don't work for us either. So don't be afraid by your garden failures. You can learn from them and maybe in the future you'll have beautiful results because of the failures that you experience in your garden. So anyway, so she's wondering about the butterfly bushes and when to trim them back. So butterfly bushes are kind of one of those, it depends where you live kind of plants. So we are a zone 5B, 6A. And for us, a lot of years, butterfly bushes act like a perennial. So butterfly bushes are a shrub, but there are some shrubs that kind of act more like a perennial. And what I mean by that is some shrubs will die back to the ground like perennials do. Other shrubs, the new growth will come off of the pre previous season sticks. Butterfly bushes are one of those plants where if you get a really hard, cold winter, it's gonna die back to the ground. But if you're in a warmer area, you're gonna get your new growth off of those old twigs. So the answer is it depends where you live. So us here in zone five, six, typically what we'll do is we will leave the old sticks from our butterfly bushes up until the spring. We'll wait to see where the new growth comes from. And if all that new growth is coming from the base of the plant, then we'll go ahead and trim all those dead twigs off. If the new growth is coming off of those old twigs that we left, we'll just let the plant go. Sometimes we'll do a little trimming if it needs a little bit of shaping, um, but that's where it, I mean, it depends on where you live. So rule of thumb is just leave all of your, your twigs and branches on them for the fall and see where they come back in the spring. All right, the next question. Hi Heidi, local Michigander here, born and raised in Traverse City, Michigan. That's about two and a half hours north of us here in Zeeland. I have a question for you. I'm very new to gardening and I just ripped out all of my annuals out of my flower bed, but I'm not sure what to do with them now. I'm also giving composting a shot, but the seeds make me not put them in there. Pinch them, toss them in the woods somewhere, what do people do with the years of breakdown from all of the deadness? Well, there's a couple options. So one thing that we do with our trimmings and or the annuals that we dig out of the garden is we have a compost pile that we dump all of our uh, remnants into, and then we have a local contractor come and remove all of that compost 
where he brings it to his house, makes a giant pile, and he's got loaders and stuff like that where he can turn that pile until it does break down into nice uh, dirt or compost. Um, also, depending on where you live, you might have like a trash service where you can put your trimmings into a trash bucket where then your recycling service or your, your trash company then takes those cuttings and brings it off to a giant uh, compost area. Uh, one thing I would say though is if you're looking to do some composting of your own that you're going to use that compost in your gardens, I would just be careful if you have like invasive weeds or stuff, maybe not put those in that compost pile. Get rid of them, let them become someone else's problem. But realistically, the heat from composting should kill off any seeds, so it shouldn't be a problem. But again, I never want to put the invasives in there and have them become a problem because my composting maybe didn't work properly. Um, also too, you know, if you have property that you can go ahead and take all your clippings and just kind of dump them out on your property somewhere out back, that's an option as well. One thing we do find, uh, this isn't so much compost related, but in our garden beds, we put a layer of mulch down every year just to kind of keep the weeds at bay and that mulch just kind of snuffs out the weeds or helps keep them so that they're minimal. Well, that, that mulch does break down over time and creates kind of a mounding feeling in our garden beds where it just continually gets fuller and fuller of soil as that mulch is breaking down. So there may come a point where in your garden beds you feel like there's just so much soil that you might have to go in and kind of dig out and remove some of that soil so that you can put your mulch back in to give you that fresh protection and layer from weeds that may develop in the garden. So hopefully that answered the question. Another question I got, and this one came from Beverly, is as we were digging out all of those annuals that still looked pretty good, she says, they still look good. Why, why are you doing that? And I get that a lot, especially too at home when we're ripping out the home gardens. People, I, I get the feeling that they're mad at us for ripping out our annuals when they still look beautiful. Part of the reason is, is I mean, we're in Michigan and we know it's inevitable that the frost will be coming soon. Once the frost comes, those annuals don't look good. So part of me is, is I wanna get the annuals out of the garden while they're not all mushy and gross. It's just easier to remove them while they're still fresh. But another part of me is, especially in the home garden, I'm just sick of it. Like I'm, I'm sick of looking at the annuals and I'm ready for a change. I'm ready to transform my garden into a fall look which for me would be adding in like garden mums, um, some daisies, that kind of thing. So I think it's just kind of a personal preference. Um, some of us like to keep the annuals until their last, last little bit of life, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I'm just ready for a change. And I know they're gonna die anyways. So that's why we do the spring transformation, even when our annuals are still looking pretty good. So that's, that's the why to ripping out plants that look good. We know what's coming. We've had a couple of reviews in the past couple of weeks too that I really wanted to share with you. Uh, many of you, and I don't always mention this in the videos, but Garden Crossings is a mail order company and we ship plants all over the United States. So we've been doing this for, boy, 20, 25 years now. Uh, we start shipping usually the end of March and ship through the first week in November. So we're getting here very close to that first week in November. So we are just about done shipping for this season, uh, but we will start taking pre-orders for spring of 2024. So if you're one of those people who is starting to plan your gardens for next year, we will be uploading new inventory that you can start your pre-orders for 2024. So Jackie says, just received my order from Garden Crossings this morning and I couldn't be more pleased. Your garden always looks spectacular. Love your videos and newsletters as well. So if you are watching on YouTube, it really, we would love it if you would actually subscribe to our channel. That helps us. Um, also too, if you comment below, I always love to get to your comments because it's, I just think it's intriguing questions that people have and just reading comments. I don't know. I feel the love when you do that. So that would really be great if you would subscribe to the channel. Uh, also, Jackie says, just a quick note to say that I just received my first order from Garden Crossings. Could not be more pleased. I ordered drops of Ju Jupiter Oregano, which I saw on your videos. 
I also get your digging in the dirt newsletter. Um, we will put a link below that if you are interested in getting our newsletter, you can go to that link and sign up for our weekly newsletters. So that's how you can sign up for that. Uh, we really appreciate your attention to detail and knowledge. I couldn't find these plants anywhere in my area, even though I think they'll do great here. I have Greek oregano as a ground cover and I am in zone 8B. It was shipped so expertly and the plants are all so healthy. A great price and a special on shipping as well. Could not ask for more. The rest is up to me. But what a healthy start you gave to these plants. That is one thing that we really do take pride in is um, shipping you healthy, well-established plants. And if you ever have questions on your shipments, just let us know right away because the sooner you let us know if there's an issue, the sooner we can help resolve that problem for you. Uh, Nikki also says, I have received many orders from Garden Crossings. Every order is just amazing as the first. Beautiful and healthy plants. The staff are friendly and helpful. Love this place. Thanks, Nikki. We appreciate your feedback. Another video we recently did was 27 plants that have fall color. So I know when planting a garden, sometimes you know, you're know you heavy on your spring color or heavy on your summer color, but once it gets to fall, the color just kind of fades away. So I think it's important that when you're creating a garden, if we can give you the tips and tools to creating a garden that is in color, like from the early spring until the late fall, um, that you'll enjoy your garden more because you'll just have more color to enjoy. So anyways, so love the fall garden tour. Notice that many are, notice the many large spike-like plants in the tall urns. What are they and how do you care for them? Are they outside winter hardy? Always take time for the kitty break. So there is always a little cat that follows me when I'm at Walter's Gardens in the trial gardens there. It's kind of fun. Um, but the plants that she's referring to are mangave. So we carried mangave probably, I don't know, eight years ago or so. At that time, it was such a new plant that they really didn't do well for us. But we are going to be bringing them back again in 2024. So what is a mangave? Mangave is a relatively new phenomenon. It's a cross between the genus Manfreda and the genus, <laughs> genius, uh, the genius was a guy that did the crossing, um, but the genus Agave. These rare hybrids combine the best of both worlds. The better growth rate and the interesting patterns of Manfreda and the habit and refinement of the Agave. So these plants are zone nine through 11 hardy. So you would be growing most of you anyways, would be growing these as annuals in your garden. They are pretty quick growing, so they do get relatively large fast, so that's a good thing. Um, they do like to be grown in a full sun area, uh, they're kind of more of a drought tolerant type plant, uh, but you, you can bring them in the house as a house plant, although that's not like the number one recommendation for this plant. Um, if you do bring them inside, you'll want to make sure you have them in a nice full sunny window and or under grow lights. So that is an option if you do wanna bring your mangaves in the house. Uh, one thing I will say is they are a little bit sharp. So if you have children in the garden, uh, you might wanna place them up high in an urn or somewhere that the kids can't reach and touch them. So another comment, I truly appreciate you including the plant names on the screen. This really helps me remember what the plant is. Thank you. So I do get that a lot in my videos where people are asking for us to put the plant name, it's hardiness zone, all the information on the plant in the video. Some videos we do, I can easily do that. Like if I'm talking about 10 plants, I can put the name up, I can list the hardiness zones. But a lot of times when I'm out in the garden doing a garden tour, I might talk about 50 to 75 plants and it's just not realistic to list every single plant that I'm talking about out in the garden um, up on the screen. And because everything I'm doing is from memory, it's really hard for me to remember the hardiness of every single plant that we have out in the garden. So what I would recommend is if I do mention a plant, just go ahead, stop the video, rewind it, listen to what I'm saying, and then you can go to our website, gardencrossings.com, for all the information on the plant that I may have talked about. And if you're like, Heidi, I don't even know what you, I can't understand what you said, or something like that, 
just leave a comment below and say, hey, Heidi, at 1257, what is the plant that you're talking about? And I'll gladly respond back and let you know what the plant is that I'm talking about. So I do apologize for when I can't get all the names and zones on the videos. Um, like I said, I try to do it if the videos are shorter videos and intentional about the different plants that we're talking about. So bear with me on that. It's just a lot of information that we'd have to put up on the screen. Nice to see your garden. I would like to know which fertilizer helps you get those plants so flowerful. So referring to the annuals that are out in the garden. So our annuals, most of them are on drip irrigation or on some type of irrigation. So they are getting watered every day. Um, even our containers, they get watered every day and or are in aqua pots, which are a self-watering pot that we fill up a couple times a week. Uh, fertilizer that we use is the Proven Winners Water Soluble Fertilizer. So I will put a link below to that fertilizer and then I'll put a little picture up on the screen of what we're talking about. We recommend fertilizing your annuals once a week with the Proven Winner Water Soluble Fertilizer. The only exception is not sun patients. They don't like fertilizer. So those may be once a month at a light dose, but the rest of your plants, your heavy feeders, like your petunias, your super tunia, uh, your super tunias, super bells, et cetera, they all like to be fed at least once a week. So the unique 241217 formulation also includes the EDDHA form of iron. Basically what that means is the iron that's used in the Proven Winners uh, water soluble fertilizer um, is easily used up no matter what the pH is of your um, soil or of your plant. So a lot of times plants will get, let's just say bound up for a lack of better terms and they can't absorb the iron. And if they can't absorb the iron, they're not gonna get fresh and green and lots of flowers but the iron that is used in this proven winter fertilizer can easily be absorbed by the plant even when the plant is not at its best. So that's why we rec recommend the proven winter fertilizer. Uh, the special blend of fertilizer designed by professional growers is a specifically made for heavy flowering, fast growing plants, which a lot of the proven winter plants are. The fast acting blend of nutrients easily absorbs when mixed in water and quickly delivers the right amount of nutrients to your garden or your containers. Uh, so we like to use this not only in the landscape, but in our planters and in window boxes as well. So for a healthy plant, we recommend, like I said, once a week fertilizing with a proven winter fertilizer. Uh, in the fall inspiration video where I was making up a fall planter, Kelly says, Thank you, I just saw the spot to pot. Question though, can I bring my own planters to use? And also, is there a charge to use this spot? Planning my spring trip to the nursery. I've already started my plant wish list. That's not a bad thing to start your plant wish list. Uh, and if you haven't started your wish list yet, go back through the videos from this summer. Lots of inspiration in those videos. So here at Garden Crossings, we do have our spot to pot. And basically what that is, is a big bench, or, or I guess we'll call it a potting bench, that you can plant up hanging baskets and containers. So how that works. Yes, you can certainly bring your own pots in. We ask that they are empty. We do not want your old dirt mixed in or in our garden center. So please dump your old dirt out of your pots, clean them out before you come in. Uh, when you come in, how it works is if you are looking to plant up, you know, annuals or whatever in your pot, we just measure how many scoops of soil you use and the charge is basically just a soil charge. Um, there's no charge for using that spot, but you do pay for the soil that you use and the plants that you use. The benefit is you can sit here and leave that dirty mess with us. Plus, how often are you like, do I need one bag of soil, two bags of soil? I don't know how much soil I'm going to need. Well, here you just plant what you need and you don't have to worry about not having enough or having leftovers. So that is the beauty. Now, if you're planning for spring, we also do spring planting parties where you can plant up pots with your favorite annuals and we'll hold them for you until around Mother's Day. When we're doing our planting parties, because we are holding those pots in our back greenhouses, 
then we have to sell you our fresh new pots. We do not allow used pots to be brought back into our growing area. There's just too much risk for us if your pots have bugs or diseases and we can't risk damaging our crop in the back. So for our planting days, which are held the beginning of April, we do require new pots to be used. That's a great question and great to plan ahead. All right, so in our garden tour at the house, I did a garden tour where I was kind of asking, answering some of your questions that you had asked in previous videos. And this one always comes up. Anything to do with hydrangeas is always a hot topic. So Mary says, what is the difference between the panicle and smooth hydrangeas? How do we tell them apart and which is better where? Well, this is gonna be very zone dependent, I think. So I'm gonna answer this based on my zone 5B6A garden, uh, but I'll add little snippets in for those of you that might be in warmer areas. So a panicle hydrangea or hardy hydrangea, we also call it, they are hardy in zones three to eight. Um, they bloom off of the new growth. So if you need to trim your hardy or panicle hydrangeas, you can trim them in the fall or in the early spring, and that's not gonna affect if you're gonna get blooms or not. They're one of the most reliable blooming hydrangeas out there. Uh, they vary in size from two foot up to 10, 12 foot, depending on the variety you get. Uh, usually they're gonna start off kind of a white lime green color, and then many, although not all of them, many of them will turn to shades of pink or magenta as that flower ages. So like the new puffer fish, that one really does not get much shades of pink on it. It just goes white and lime. Um, so not all of them do get that pretty pink color, but many of them do. Um, another thing to say is they're for full sun to part sun. But if you live in the south, you might find that full sun is maybe too much sun for them. So I've heard from those of you that are in the south that maybe a part sun area is better. Also, I've heard from those of you in the south that you don't always get that beautiful pink or magenta color just because your nights aren't cool enough. So that, that pink color that you get later on in the season is really gonna be dependent on where you live and just how the degree of pink that you might get. Uh, the other one is a smooth hydrangea or an arborescent hydrangea. Probably the most popular one out there would be the Annabelle hydrangea, which we don't carry because there's many other varieties that are much more uh, sturdy than the Annabelle. The Annabelle's kind of a flopper at times, um, but those are hardy in zones three to eight also. They bloom off a new growth, can be trimmed in the fall or in the spring. So again, they're, they're another very reliable hydrangea. Um, they usually will start off either pink, white, or lime. Um, the pink ones will just continue to stay pink the whole time. Um, a lot of times the white or lime ones will take on shades of like a light or dusty pink. Uh, neither the panicle or the arborescent hydrangea can be turned blue. So they're not gonna be your blue option. Uh, those would be like your big leaf hydrangeas. Um, smooth hydrangeas too, I think I said it, but they bloom off of the new growth so you don't have to worry about the reliability. So both are very reliable hydrangeas. I really, one over the other, um, the panicles are more of a cone shaped flower, a little bit bigger flower. The arborescents, they do have big flowers too, but they're more of like a mop head type of shape. So I think it really is personal preference, um, but both of them are very reliable bloomers. So I would say you really can't go wrong with either one. So kind of a follow-up to the hydrangea question is, do you prune all of the panicle hydrangeas every year or every several years? So with the panicle hydrangeas, kind of the rule of thumb is trim them by a third. So take like the top third off of them. And that can be done every year. Like when you're trimming off your spent blooms, you can take off about a third of that plant. Now, I personally find that I like to trim mine back pretty hard about every three to four years or so. And part of that is, is sometimes they just get so big that I wanna kinda take them down a little bit smaller, um, which sometimes helps. But I did a bunch of videos on pruning hydrangeas last fall, and I took them down to about two foot, and they all were right back at their um, height. 
One problem if you drastically trim every year though, is that your stems won't be as, um, as hardy or as, I shouldn't say hardy because then you're going to think it's going to die, but your stems won't be as firm. They're going to be more floppy. So that's why kind of that third rule of thumb is best, but sometimes you do just have to do, do more if the plant is getting too big. So one thing though, don't be afraid to trim because if you have a plant that you're just not happy with because you think it's got an ugly shape or it's just too big or something, you're already kind of grumbling about the plant. So just go ahead and trim it worst case scenario it dies but you're already grumbling you didn't like it best case scenario in in most cases it's going to come back beautifully so don't be afraid to trim your your plants all right and the last thing is a few weeks ago i put a picture of rod intently studying at the computer i says it's a numbers game it's a speculation game it's a he's about ready to pull his hair out kind of day there is no way I would want to be in his chair today. If only we could read the minds of shoppers and see into the future. But he's enjoying the view. He was up at the Northern Michigan Garden. So that kind of makes everything just a little bit better. So the question is, what is on your plant list for 2024? I know we've talked about a lot of plants this summer, this year. Uh, some new varieties giving you insight to actually probably a lot of new varieties for 2024. So. I would like to leave this video asking you, what is on your wish list for 2024? Um, we have our numbers set. Like I said, we had, we were trying to read your minds to know what we need to add for next year. But if you can give us any feedback on plants that um, maybe we don't carry that you would like to see in 2024, that would be very valuable to us. So we would appreciate those comments below. Rod will really, really appreciate it because that just gives us a glimpse into what people might be looking for in 2024. If you're new to our station, we appreciate you watching. Like I said before, we'd love it if you would subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings.